Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, webinar. Um, so I'm Alan Barrett, the director uh, of the ESRI, and today uh, we're launching a, a new uh, ESRI report in a collaboration with the Shared Island Unit in the Department uh, of the Taoiseach, uh, the title Social and Political Attitudes in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, as most of you, at least a good many of you like, on the call uh, will know, uh, the Institute has been working with the Shared Island Unit uh, for a number of years now, uh, where what we essentially been trying to do is sort of build up a body of work uh, to generate more insights onto uh, all Ireland, uh, shared Ireland uh, issues. Uh, we've looked at some economics issues, such as productivity. We've looked at issues around public service delivery, such as health um, education. And uh, today we're looking at yet a, an, another strand uh, where we're looking at attitudinal research. Um, I have to say, uh, this is one of these studies, even if you were to do the study in the Republic of Ireland or Northern Ireland, it would be tremendously interesting uh, to look at the two jurisdictions together uh, and uh, to, to track, um, you know, the, the evolution of attitudes over time is absolutely uh, fascinating. So um, there's a number of authors on the report. I'm going to read them to make sure I uh, get everybody included. So the report is authored by James Lawrence, Stephanie Sprong, Fran McGinnity, Helen Russell and Grant Shingray. Um, I think for the present presentation today, uh, if I'm right, it's James and Fran, and I'll call on them uh, just in a, in a moment uh, to go through the results of the, uh, of the, of the report. Uh, we've got a sort of a, a, a tight uh, webinar today, if I can put it like that. Um, we're just going to have a presentation by the authors, which will take about half an hour. And then we're going to go straight to questions and answers uh, from you, the audience. So if you want to sort of be thinking about your questions and then enter them into the Q&A function, uh, I'll try and moderate a discussion and feed the, uh, the questions through uh, to the panel. I should say we've got about uh, over 200 people uh, on the call, uh, the level of interest in this area of work has been quite phenomenal and very, very gratifying. Uh, so uh, great to have so many people uh, here. And uh, it's always nice for me to have the opportunity to thank the Shared Island Unit in the Department of Taoiseach uh, for funding this work, uh, which the ESRI has been delighted uh, to undertake because that it's, it's, it's just been fascinating and I think very, very impactful. So with that, uh, I'm going to call, I don't know if it's Fran or James, I'm going to kick off. I think it's James. So uh, James, do you want to turn on your camera? Oh, I got it wrong. It's Fran who's going to kick off then, is it? Uh, okay, first mistake of the day. So listen, I'll uh, ask you then to start sharing the slides, Fran, and uh, to start taking us to the results. Thanks, Alan. I'll just start uh, sharing my slides now. You just confirm that you can see them. Yes, we yeah. can see them, Fran. All good. Yeah. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fran McGinnity. I'm an associate research professor here at the ESRI. And as Alan said, we're here to present the latest report in a major research program comparing Ireland and Northern Ireland. This one compares social and political attitudes over the past 25 years. I'm a sociologist by training and I'm interested, among other things, in how society's function and I find it very interesting to compare these two. So I'm going to present the introduction and context and then my colleague and lead author James Lawrence will take over to take you through some of the findings. We're presenting on behalf of our co-authors which include Stephanie Sprong, Helen Russell and Garance Hingre. Helen and Garance will be joining us on the panel to answer some of your questions. We look at a wide range of attitudes in this report. We're trying to give a rounded picture, getting at the issue from a number of angles. The presentation aims to, to give you a flavor of these uh, findings. We go quite fast, but we should have some time for questions at the end. I'd like to thank at this point, uh, colleagues from the Shared Island Unit for their support of the project, and also Dr. Paula Devine from Queen's University Belfast, who acted as project advisor. So, as Alan mentioned, this program is part of a larger research program, which is building up comparative evidence of economic and social outcomes in Ireland and, and Northern Ireland. Many of these are focused on important issues like educational qualifications, earnings, productivity. We aim to complement this research by tapping into people's experiences and their views of their society. Things like trust in other people, how well they think their society is functioning from the ground up, 
so to speak, tapping social cohesion. As many of you will know, while there are social, historical and geographical similar similarities between Ireland and Northern Ireland, political institutions and the social, political and economic history of the past hundred years is very different. So what attitudes do we look at? We tap into four dimensions of people's attitudes towards their society and their experience within it. As I said, the idea is to give a rounded picture. In terms of political attitudes, we look at satisfaction with democracy, found to tap into how well a country's government is working and the legitimacy of that government. government. Then there's political efficacy. That's a response to the question, my voice counts in my country. The extent to which people believe they can affect change in society via their political voice. We also look at expectations for the future, perceptions that life will be better next year, because hope and optimism for the future is a useful short-term assessment of where people think their country is traveling and associated with many other outcomes. We also look at trust. Trust is important for societies. Here we look at social trust, which is trust in other people. And we also look at people's trust in institutions, how fairly people think um, institutions, that's things like uh, the media, the justice system, the um, political institutions, how well they're they're um, they're working. These are this is also considered a useful component and foundation of social cohesion. Finally, we look at attitudes towards redistribution and inequality. You know, this notion of should government reduce income inequality or should incomes be more equal? We're not going to be presenting the findings of the attitudes towards redistribution, but we're they're in the report and we're happy to take questions on them. So now the questions we look at, there are three main ones. How do these social and political attitudes differ between Northern Ireland and Ireland? And how do they change over time? Looking over time gives us a potentially deeper understanding of what might shape attitudes rather than a sort of snapshot of the now. Understanding past trends might help frame current attitudes and potentially also the future. The data that um, we use for the report, um, unfortunately, the uh, booster sample of Northern Ireland stops in 2018. So um, we have to stop the clock in 2018 for Northern Ireland, while in Ireland we can go on to, to 2023. We also look as a second question within the jurisdictions. Are there group differences in these trends between people with higher education and lower education. This has been shown by international research to have a, quite an impact on social and political attitudes. And also whether older and younger generations differ in terms of these attitudes, because this could be seen as a potential driver of change over time if we find that the younger generations have um, very different attitudes from their older peers. And then finally, we, we ask how do attitudes in Northern Ireland and Ireland compare to, to those in Great Britain and in Western Europe, just as a sense of how high is high in, in terms of putting these attitudes in context. I should note at this point, there's no analysis of the constitutional question or community relations in Northern Ireland. Um, these have been well, um, there's been quite extensive research in the, on these to date using, for example, the um, Northern Ireland Life and Times survey. And also we have no data on religious affiliation in our main European data source. So there's no analysis by religion, nor indeed is this a key factor in understanding attitudes in Ireland. Just as a very brief uh, point of context here, uh, Obviously, I'm leaving out much of the of the detail here in terms of Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, in this period. On the left here in the mustard box, we see that um, up until the mid 90s, Ireland was largely white Catholic. Um, but the economic boom known as the Celtic Tiger had a transformative effect on Ireland, not only in terms of economic change, but rapid social and cultural change 
as evidenced by the referenda on same-sex marriage and abortion. There's been political stability in Ireland, at least continuous coalition government, though the 20 elect 2020 election saw some change in, in voting patterns. Economically in Ireland, the sustained economic boom had a massive effect on the labour market and living standards, but was followed by one of the deepest and most protracted recessions in Europe with far reaching austerity measures. Since 2013, there's been labour market recovery and some easing of those austerity measures. Turning then in the light blue to Northern Ireland, we see the backdrop to the period of which we're studying with the protracted ethnic conflict known as the Troubles, which saw a deeply divided society between nationalists and unionists. The Good Friday Agreement in 1998 ushered in a period of peace and power sharing. Power sharing is, uh, between the two main communities has proved difficult to sustain. In fact, since it began, the executive has been, the Northern Ireland Assembly has been suspended for over 40% of its life. The troubles have cast a long shadow. The 2016 Brexit referendum also brought some greater insecurity around a, a, a future arrangements for Northern Ireland and discussion of, of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Economically, the, the 2008 recession and subsequent austerity was not as dramatic as Ireland, but austerity has been more protracted and uh, we see the impact on people's standards of living between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Here, just turning to the economic, this chart illustrates it more vividly. This is um, the unemployment rate uh, between 1998 and 2002 in Ireland, and here we see the peak in uh, the recession period, and uh, this was much less marked, the blue line here being Northern Ireland. Um, in terms of, uh, as well as key social, political and economic events, attitudes may also shift in response to longer term social transformation. Religion, as one of these, has been very important in, uh, and indeed a key source of difference in Northern Ireland. But I should stress that um, uh, both societies are becoming less religious, both in terms of religious practice and in and their stated affiliation. There's been a rise in educational attainment in both North and South, the widening of the um, Ireland, Northern Ireland gap in educational attainment over time, shown by a previous research in this programme. There's also been immigration and increasing diversity, particularly in Ireland, but also in Northern Ireland. So, just turning to our evidence base then and analysis plan, measuring attitudes like this is challenging and we want to make sure we're getting an accurate picture. So we use the best high quality representative survey data, uh, which asks people in, in Northern Ireland and Ireland identical carefully worded questions. Identical questions mean we can be sure that differences are not due to question wording. Um, but rather differences between the, the societies. Using the Eurobarometer as our evidence base here means the data is highly comparable, though the cost is a separate sample for Northern Ireland uh, ends in 2018. Uh, for the analysis, we compare trends and levels over time. We compare, uh, we do some comparisons uh, with Great Britain in Western Europe, and we compare trends across social groups. We use regression modeling to test whether changes in composition can explain changes in outcomes over time, but it's a primarily narrative description. At this point now, I'm going to stop sh sharing and hand over to my um, colleague, James Lawrence, to present some of our results. Thanks, Ron. Um, okay, so now we'll turn to taking you through some of the key findings from the report. Um, unfortunately, as Fran said, we can't look at the results from the report, but we'll, all the results from the report, but we'll focus on a few key attitudes to give you a sense of the findings. So we'll start by looking at one of the key measures of people's political attitudes, that is their satisfaction with democracy. Um, so looking first at people's satisfaction with democracy, this figure shows the proportion of people who respond that they are very or fairly satisfied with democracy in Ireland and Northern Ireland since 1998. 
Because the Eurobarometer survey was a cross-national European survey, it's important to note that people in Ireland were asked about the way democracy works in Ireland, and people in Northern Ireland were asked about the way democracy works in the United Kingdom. So in Ireland, the Green Line, we see the key role the recession and subsequent period of austerity measures likely played in people's satisfaction with democracy. In the pre-recession period, satisfaction was generally stable and high, with around 70 to 80% of people reporting being satisfied. However, around the onset of the recession, satisfaction declined precipitously, halving from around 80% of people being satisfied to less than 40%. It then recovered some ground by 2009, before entering a period of slow recovery of around 10 years back to its pre-recession levels in 2018. Interestingly, in more recent years, things like the pandemic, cost of living crisis, housing crisis, and pressures on health services don't appear to be showing up in people's satisfaction with democracy. It tends to remain relatively stable, apart from a slight dip around the time of the pandemic. In fact, by the last survey in January, February 2023, Satisfaction with democracy was at some of its highest levels it's been for the past 25 years. In Northern Ireland, that's the red line, a somewhat different picture emerges. Just before the start of the 21st century, there was a large gap in satisfaction with democracy between Ireland and Northern Ireland, with lower levels in Northern Ireland. This gap actually widened between 1998 and 2002, which appears to coincide with a rise in troubles-related violence in Northern Ireland, events such as the Holy Cross dispute and worsening perceptions of community relations between Protestants and Catholics. Perhaps counterintuitively, this worsening of satisfaction also corresponds to the start of power sharing, which at the time was really struggling to bed in. Post-2002, Northern Ireland then saw a large and steady improvement in satisfaction with democracy up to around 2006. And this was also a period of declining troubles-related violence, perceptions that community relations were improving, and also when the power sharing was temporarily suspended as well. As in Ireland, satisfaction with democracy also sharply declined around the onset of the recession, although the drop was much smaller than occurred in, than occurred in Ireland. This was then followed by a similar period of slow recovery as the economy recovered, but also actually as the power sharing in Northern Ireland was re-established. However, as you can see from 2016, this upwards trend stalled, after which we've started to see satisfaction with democracy decline again. And a series of events during this period may have precipitated this new decline, including the near collapse of the assembly in 2015, the Brexit vote of 2016 and subsequent concerns around its impact on the border on the island of Ireland, and the suspension of power sharing from 2017 onwards. The results of this has been a growing gap in attitudes between Ireland and Northern Ireland from 2015 onwards. However, in spite of this greater volatility of attitudes in Northern Ireland, at least up to 2018, which is our last data point, there has actually been a gradual longer term improvement in satisfaction with democracy over the past 20 years. And next slide, please. So in this next figure, we overlay the trends in satisfaction with democracy for Great Britain and the average level across the countries in the EU 15 to see how Ireland and Northern Ireland fare compared to other jurisdictions. So as we can see, comparatively speaking, Ireland has some of the highest satisfaction with democracy across the, across the period and across jurisdictions. Compared to this, early in the 21st century, Northern Ireland had some of the lowest, although in recent years in Northern Ireland, levels of satisfaction with democracy have become more similar to the EU15 and Great Britain. Interestingly, this figure also demonstrates how the recession affected all jurisdictions, but also just how negative the impact of the recession was in Ireland. Next slide, please. So, so far, we've focused on the overall trends in attitudes across jurisdictions. However, as Fran said, different social groups in society may have different experiences, which may shape their, uh, their trends and attitudes. So what this next slide shows is the trends in satisfaction with democracy across different education groups. This includes more educated individuals, that's those who, were, who finished education age 20 and older, and that's the green line on the graphs, and less educated individuals, that's those who finished education age 19 or below and that's the blue line on the graphs. So just to keep in mind, this is the age people finished education and not the age of people themselves. So 
we show these trends for Ireland on the left-hand graph and Northern Ireland on the right-hand graph. Interestingly, we see that in both Ireland and Northern Ireland, there has been a widening of the gap in satisfaction with democracy between more and less educated groups. Before the recession, there were small educational differences in Ireland and no real differences in Northern Ireland. Around the time of the recession, both more and less educated groups experienced a sharp decline in satisfaction with democracy. However, in the post-recession period, a larger education gap emerged with more educated, more educated groups recovering quicker than less educated groups. In Ireland, it's not really until around the 2020s that this gap really shrank back to pre-recession levels, although there is some indication it started to widen again somewhat in 2023. In Northern Ireland, however, the gap was still present by 2018. That's our last data point. So one possible explanation for this pattern is that after the recession, more educated groups recovered faster economically from the, from the recession. Meanwhile, lower educated groups who often carried the scars of the recession for longer may have felt greater disenchantment with government due to great economic hardship or perceived marginalization, especially in light of the austerity-driven welfare reforms. Next slide, please. Okay, so we turn next to looking at another one of our uh, attitudinal measures, and that is people's optimism about their future. This figure shows the proportion of people in each jurisdiction who believe that their life will be better in the next 12 months. In Ireland, that's the green line, we again see the key role that the recession has likely played in people's attitudes. Before the recession, optimism in Ireland was fairly stable, with around 40 to 50% of people feeling their life will be better next year. However, with the onset of the recession, optimism collapsed, declining from 50% to just 20%. This remained depressed before rapidly recovering again from around 2013 onwards, reaching close to its pre-recession levels by 2015 as the economy in Ireland recovered. However, from 2019, optimism in Ireland declined again. And excluding the bump in 2021, which was likely driven by the end of the pandemic, optimism has generally remained at just over 30% since 2019 in Ireland. So one possibility is that multiple and at times compounding sources of instability in recent years, such as the pandemic, the housing crisis, pressures on the health system and cost of living crisis may have all affected optimism in Ireland. Indeed, optimism is now around 20 percentage points lower than its pre-recession high. In Northern Ireland, the red line, we actually see that unlike satisfaction with democracy, optimism was just as high in Ireland, just as high as in Ireland between 1998 and 2007. Optimism also drops with the onset of the recession and by 2012 had declined to the same levels as Ireland. As in Ireland, optimism also began the same path to recovery in 2013. However, as we saw with satisfaction with democracy, the recovery in optimism halts around 2015 and subsequently begins to decline again. This coincides, as we outlined previously, with this period of growing political instability. I say what's particularly striking, however, is the longer term decline in optimism seen in Northern Ireland, which is now at some of its lowest levels for the past 20 years. Next slide, please. So as before, this next figure overlays the trends in optimism for Great Britain and the average level across the EU 15 countries. We see that comparatively, optimism is higher in Ireland, Northern Ireland and Great Britain before the recession compared to the EU 15. We also see that optimism in Northern Ireland trends more closely to optimism in Great Britain up to around 2012. After this point, the trends diverge somewhat, especially from 2015 onwards. Next slide, please. So in this next figure, we again look at whether the trends in optimism differed between more educated groups, that's the green line, and less educated groups, that's the blue line. In Ireland, the left-hand figure, we see a large pre-recession education gap in optimism. However, this time, ed the education gap actually gets smaller over time, especially in the post-recession period. This is driven by somewhat larger declines in optimism among the more educated group. However, in 2022 and 2023, we've seen the re-emergence of a substantial education gap in optimism in Ireland. In fact, in 2023, optimism among the lower educated group is at levels last seen since around the recession. 
And this may reflect a growing impact of the cost of living crisis, which has likely had a bigger impact on less educated groups. In Northern Ireland, there is a much bigger pre-recession gap in optimism between more and less educated groups. Over the past 20 years, <clears throat> excuse me, over the past 20 years, optimism has generally declined among both more and less educated groups in Northern Ireland, especially in the aftermath of the recession. However, this decline has been particularly pronounced among the more educated group. This is actually quite a staggering decline. Optimism has dropped by almost 40 percentage points over the 20 year period, which has now essentially closed the education gap in optimism completely by 2018. You see, this trend among the more educated group in Northern Ireland may be a result of several factors. Research has shown wage returns to higher education tend to be lower in Northern Ireland, and there may be uh, perceptions of more limited job opportunities as well. Indeed, uh, research has shown that many university graduates in Northern Ireland leave for job opportunities elsewhere or study away and do not return on graduation. In addition, potentially more educated groups may have become especially disillusioned by the recent political instability in Northern Ireland, while less educated groups perhaps had already comparatively lower optimism to begin with. Next slide, please. So another dimension of societal attitudes is people's trust in their society's institutions and trust in other people in general. For this presentation, we'll just focus on people's social trust in one another. Next slide, please. So the Eurobarometer data did not contain repeated measures of social trust over the period of analysis. And this means we cannot directly compare how levels of social trust have changed over time between Ireland and Northern Ireland. What we can do, however, is draw on a mixture of data sets to generate an overall comparison between the two jurisdictions. So to begin with, we can get a sense of whether levels of social trust differ between Ireland and Northern Ireland using the most recent data available. That's the 2017 euro parameter. So what this figure shows is the proportion of people who agree or agree strongly that people in general can be trusted. We see that in 2017, social trust is 22 percentage points higher in Ireland compared to Northern Ireland. However, at the same time, trust in Northern Ireland is broadly similar to levels of trust in Great Britain and the EU 15 in 2017. Next slide, please. In this figure, we draw on two different data sets to compare how social trust has changed over time across Ireland and Northern Ireland. Social trust is available in the European Social Survey for Ireland every two years from 2002. And an identical question was asked in the World Value Survey for Northern Ireland at three time points, 1999, 2008, and 2022. So importantly, while the question for Ireland and, Ireland and Northern Ireland is identical, each survey used different response categories. And this essentially means that we can't directly compare the levels of trust using these data sets, but what we can do is directly compare the trends over time. So on the whole, we actually see trends in people's trust in one another are relatively similar in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Trust declines from the start of the 21st century to around 2007 and 2008. This is close to the time of the recession. In Ireland, this trust remains depressed until 2015, when it starts to recover again, and by 2022, it's just about at pre-recession levels. In Northern Ireland, we also see that by 2022, social trust has broadly recovered to its levels pre-recession. Again, the timing of these trends really suggests that the recession played a significant role in people's trust in one another in both jurisdictions. Next slide, please. We can also look again at whether trends in social trust differed between more and less educated groups. So this figure looks at trends in trust among the higher educated groups, the green line, and lower educated groups, the blue line. In Ireland on the left-hand side and Northern Ireland on the right-hand side. And what we see is that in both Ireland and Northern Ireland, there is the emergence and a widening gap in social trust between more and less educated groups. More educated groups tended to see a somewhat smaller decline in trust around the onset of the recession, but more importantly, their social trust appeared to recover more quickly than the less educated group. And critically, by 2022, the more educated group had levels of trust equal to, if not higher than before the recession. 
Less educated groups, meanwhile, tended to see a larger decline in trust around the recession, and their trust remained more depressed for a longer period. And as we can see from this figure, this has led to a significant widening gap in levels of social trust over the last 20 years or so between more and less educated groups. And what's particularly striking is that at the most recent available time points in each jurisdiction, social trust remains lower among the less educated group than it was at the start of the century, especially in Northern Ireland. And next slide, please. Okay. So we'll now summarize some of the key findings that have emerged from the report, uh, but here we'll draw on all the attitudes we have looked at throughout the report and uh, not just those from the presentation. So in Ireland, social and political attitudes appear to have been significantly shaped by the 2008 recession and subsequent period of austerity and welfare reform. With the onset of the crash, satisfaction with democracy, political trust, media trust, trust in other people and optimism all saw notable declines, while support for reducing income inequality actually increased during this period. However, we also see that some groups, particularly lower educated groups, may have experienced a deeper impact of the recession. Their attitudes often declined further, took longer to recover, and in some cases are still yet to recover to their pre-recession levels, as in the case of trust in other people. And this has led to an emergence or widening gap in attitudes between more and less educated groups for much of the post-recession period. Recent years in Ireland, especially from 2019 onwards, have also seen greater instability in attitudes. We find that perceived political efficacy and optimism saw overall declines during this period. Trust in the media in Ireland began to decline in 2022, while beliefs that the government should reduce income inequality increased again from 2019. And so potentially the multiple and again at times compounding crises in recent years may be beginning to show up in some of the attitudes in Ireland. In Northern Ireland, the findings also suggest the recession played a role in shaping people's attitudes. But at the same time, as discussed, shifts in attitudes in Northern Ireland also tend to coincide with periods of political stability and political instability. We also saw in Northern Ireland a similar emergence or widening of education gaps in uh, attitudes in the post-2008 period, especially, again, for people's trust in others. From around 2015 onwards, however, Northern Ireland has seen attitudes enter another period of decline. Satisfaction with democracy, optimism, political trust and judicial trust have all declined between 2016 and 2018 in Northern Ireland at our last data point. As, dis as discussed, these declines occurred at a time of renewed political instability in Northern Ireland. However, there have also been several longer term changes occurring in attitudes in Northern Ireland. There has been a general rise and improvement in satisfaction with democracy since the start of the century. But at the same time, political trust, media trust, and especially optimism have seen longer term declines over the past 20 years or so in Northern Ireland. Next slide, please. Although we haven't had a chance to discuss them in the presentation, in the report itself, we also find some evidence of longer term generational changes in attitudes. In Northern Ireland, older generations tend to hold more positive attitudes than younger generations. And over time, these generational differences appear to have widened. For example, generational differences in satisfaction with democracy, political voice, political trust, and social trust appear to have widened over time. And this is due to faster improvements in attitudes amongst older cohorts and more stability or even declines among uh, younger generations. In Ireland, generational differences appear smaller and more stable. However, in recent years, in both Northern Ireland and Ireland, younger generations appear to be experiencing somewhat worsening of attitudes relative to older generations. This includes things like optimism, satisfaction with democracy, and perceived political efficacy. And this could be because younger generations experienced a more negative impact of the pandemic on things like their education, labor market opportunities, or even their mental health. Younger generations may also be experiencing thwarted aspirations, driven especially by housing costs and their ability to own a home. 
in Northern Ireland in particular, there may also be a growing frustration at the perceived per paralysis of the Stormont institutions and inability to address pressing needs in their lives. Um, overall, though, over the period studied, attitudes are generally more positive in Ireland than Northern Ireland. And indeed, attitudes in Ireland are some of the most positive compared to Great Britain and the EU 15. Attitudes in Northern Ireland, meanwhile, have generally been some of the least positive across jurisdictions over the period, although this seems to have shrunk somewhat in the later period. Next slide, please. So we'll briefly touch on some of the limitations of the study. Um, the main limitation is that directly comparable data for Northern Ireland ended in 2018. As such, it's hard to say exactly where attitudes in Northern Ireland might have traveled since, especially given the recent significant events. In the report, we do explore where some attitudes have gone using the World Value Survey, which surveyed people in Northern Ireland in 2022. And at least using this data set, it seems that confidence in political institutions was at its lowest level for the past 25 years. Another limitation is that we don't directly test what factors are driving the changes in attitudes. Instead, we look at the most likely drivers based on what was occurring in each jurisdiction at the time attitudes were changing. As such, the kind of drivers we've been outlining here are not an exhaustive list and other factors might be at work. And lastly, as is clear, we haven't explored the role of religious affiliation or political identity in the study. And this, as Fran mentioned, is primarily because the Eurobarometer data did not contain repeated measures of religious affiliation. It is indeed likely that behind the overall trends we've been looking at, differences in attitudes will exist between different religious groups, especially in Northern Ireland. Next slide, please. So we'll just wrap up with several insights we feel the report reveals that may uh, be useful to governments and civil society to help foster more positive societal attitudes across jurisdictions. Firstly, it's clear that the health of the economy and how governments respond to economic crises appear critical in shaping perceptions of society, especially as we've seen in Ireland. While the lost decade for Ireland's economy is often discussed, this report shows how Ireland experienced a corresponding lost decade of trust and political satisfaction. And potentially Ireland's greater openness to the global economy, it brings benefits, but it also renders it vulnerable to global economic crises, which can have severe knock-on effects for the social and political health of society. The second point is that governments also appear to play a key role in shaping people's attitudes. In particular, maintaining a functioning political system in which governments are able to implement positive changes and are responsive to public needs and concerns appears crucial. This appears particularly salient in Northern Ireland, given the severity of political instability that has taken place. We also see that attention needs to be paid to growing divides in societal attitudes, especially between more and less educated groups. This can indicate that not all groups feel they are participating equally in society and sharing its benefits. Continued efforts to both protect such groups from crises and provide support for equal economic and social participation in society is necessary to really maintain cohesive and positive relationships across societies. Governments in both jurisdictions also need to recognize evidence that their youngest generations appear to be becoming somewhat more pessimistic about their society, or at least falling behind older generations. This could be a short-term dip, however, it may reflect the beginning of broader longer-term declines, which, if they persist, may lead to more negative attitudes overall in the future. And lastly, the report demonstrates the value that having ongoing comparable data on attitudes can have for informing our understanding of society and societal change on the island of Ireland. The report points to the need for an independent, government-financed, ongoing attitude survey that is protected from political changes and is also less reliant on ad hoc participation by non-governmental institutions. And this can provide detailed monitoring into social dynamics. One option would be to coordinate a survey with the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey, and this could have common question modules or some ongoing identical questions. And this would really have a significant potential to gauge the social and political health of societies and track and understand convergence or divergence in attitudes on the island. Next slide, please. So 
Finally, if you'd like to read the report in full, it is available online now at the following webpage. Um, further information on the ESRI Shared Island Research Program, including all the past reports, can also be found online at the following address. And uh, lastly, in the new year, we have two new reports coming out. Uh, one is another ESRI Shared Island Unit report on gender and labor market inclusion. And one will be a report on attitudes towards immigration and refugees in Ireland. And thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you so much, uh, James. And uh, I'm gonna welcome Fran back uh, onto the panel and also uh, report co-authors Helen and Garanch, uh, if you wanna join us as well. Uh, we'll get things going. So as I said at the outset, if people want to submit questions uh, through the Q&A function, uh, please do. And some questions are coming in already. We've got about 15 minutes, so uh, we'll see how well we can do. Uh, there were just a, a couple of overarching questions that I can deal with very, very quickly. Uh, the first is, when will the report be available to read? I, I think it is actually on the website uh, already. Uh, I see heads nodding, so it, it is there if people want to go and read it. And then in terms of the presentations, um, I think it's typically the case in the Institute that uh, when an event finishes, we do put the slides up on the website. Uh, if you go to the events section, uh, by four o'clock today, this will be in the past events, uh, but you'll find it there and you'll find the slides. Uh, but if for any reason you have any difficulty, I know any of the authors uh, would be very, very happy to send on the, uh, the information. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go to... Uh, the questions and uh, Stephen Rolston uh, has the first one here and uh, let's put it, it, it we should probably just deal with this because uh, I think it's on a lot of people's minds Stephen's question is as follows given recent events in Dublin how does that feed into the findings of this study particularly trust in institutions uh, I know this is beyond the scope of the study as such uh, but I don't know if any of you just want to take some sort of a stab about what, what does that say about uh, trusted institutions in this case of the Republic um, or will it have an impact on trusted institutions? Does anybody want to say anything about it? Fran? Hi, um, Alan. Yes, I can kick off. I suppose um, the first thing to say that it's important uh, to stress that a uh, you know, the attitudes of vocal minorities don't necessarily reflect the attitudes of the of the population. So we're very much focusing on a on a broad brush representative surveys of, of the populations. And also that um, while, as James said, there have been some declines, uh, you know, since since 2019 in, in recent years in media trust, some declines in, in, in optimism. Um, you know, attitudes in, in Ireland of the general population are still very, very positive and positive in comparative perspective. I think that's probably uh, useful to highlight here. OK, let's move on to um, the sort of questions that are more focused on, on the study. So next one, Thomas McCann. Uh, so were the voices of ethnic minority groups considered, such as Roma travellers and other minority groups, um, and again, Thomas goes on to sort of reflect on much higher levels of unemployment and other forms of disadvantage amongst this group. But I guess there's a broader question there. In all our social science surveys, there's a tendency to miss certain groups. Um, presumably the data that you're using may suffer the same difficulty. So does, again, somebody want to address that one? Yes. I mean, the, the voices of, of um, <clears throat> minority groups may have been included, but we can't, uh, th th there won't be enough of them and we can't identify them in these surveys. We do have other studies and in fact, some other studies coming in, in 2024 that look, uh, focus, for example, more on, on travellers and a previous research that James and I were involved in comparing Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, looked at a uh, at, at migrants and diversity <clears throat> more generally. But uh, I think uh, for the sort of overall population attitudes that we're looking at, these numbers are are too small uh, for, of, of, of these groups. Okay, now I'm, I'm gonna, keep, there's a quite a number of questions, so I'm just gonna keep throwing them uh, at you guys. So next one from Maliki Campbell. Could you say why the satisfaction with democracy dropped so sharply from 2005? Uh, this is before the crash of 2008, so it looks like the recession isn't the cause. So I think that, I don't know if somebody wants to scroll back at the slides. Um, I, 
I, I have a feeling that might be in the in the Republic of Ireland, and it, it did look like the fall in democracy. Now maybe it's just the way that pictures were lined up or something like that, but it it looked like there was a a decline just before the Great Recession. In Ireland, it's two thousand and seven anyway, so it it does uh, line up, I suppose. The the um but the, the but the recession really get, it was really two thousand eight. I suppose yeah the 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 um. I suppose was there was already a sense um, that the good times were coming to the end. I think already in two thousand and seven, having uh, having lived through it, that there was already a um, a sense that things were were uh, slowing down. But um, yeah. and actually, yeah, that's interesting. I I, yeah. I I can't quite remember. It's one of these sort of things. Somebody on the call might correct us, but um, was Nor Northern Rock in two thousand and seven? I mean, it it looks like there was a collapse across the. The British Isles, if I could put it like that. Um, so may maybe, as you say, Helen, the the uh, the darkening clouds or whatever like that were uh, co coming to be noticed uh, at the, at that stage. So maybe maybe that's the answer. Okay, we'll we'll keep moving. Jenny Roth has a question. So do you think the low trust uh, for less educated people is it about education or about the associated uh, factor economy? So I suppose again, a uh, clear question: Is it about the experiences within education or whatever? Uh, or is it a, a, a broader set of factors? So again, somebody want yeah. to put their hand up quickly? Off you go, James. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I suppose we should uh, say this at the outset. We're not saying uh, any of the attitudes are related to education, level of education per se, the kind of experiences within, um, whether people have more or less of it necessarily. Uh, we're often using, and this is a fact in society, education is often is a proxy for people's kind of socioeconomic status and um, the kind of uh, jobs they work in or the kind of communities they live in just because it can end up structuring people's resources by quite a lot. And so in terms of the trust that we saw and um, the division in trust, especially the widening over time, this is probably much more because people with lower education were much more susceptible to the harsher realities of the recession, suffered much more, experienced much more uh, of a negative impact, really. Okay, um, two people, including Eddie McGoldrick and another uh, participant have asked, can you just remind us why the Northern Ireland data stopped in 2018? Yep, so we have done some digging on this and we have tried to find out anywhere uh, for a, a particular reason on it, but we can't. And it, based on the timing, it just seems to coincide with uh, the UK deciding to leave the EU. Previous to that, um, with the UK in the EU, um, Northern Ireland was considered a kind of separate um, region to oversample. And then for whatever reason, presumably because they left, they decided to stop that oversampling, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Carmel Hannan, then uh, I'll read out Carmel's uh, question. So the findings appears to point to the importance of income effects. So given the role of the recession and educational differences, that's qualifying the importance of income effects, were you able to, able to look at income changes or differences? Uh, congrats to all the authors on this timely report. So I guess it's, it's it, it, Carmel's asking essentially for a deeper dive on uh, in, income changes or income differences. So are, are they there? Um, in, yeah, sure. Uh, so um, I'm not sure income was asked consistently in every year of the data set that we used. And unfortunately, I think when they do ask about it, it's often uh, done in deciles or quintiles, for example. So it's difficult to know whether any kind of changes are linked to absolute changes or relative changes in income as well. But uh, if you go to the website, we do have a, a supplementary appendix of quite a few graphs uh, where you can dig into, you know, see whether there were any differences in trends across things like social class as well, or employment status. So kind of taken together, you can get a general sense of uh, how economic status is related to these trends. Okay, excuse me for coughing. Um, next one, uh, what age groups are included in the report? Is, is, is it across all age groups or? What are the good old points? Um, I'm pretty sure it's, I think it's usually, it's 16, 16 and above. So it just, okay, it doesn't so include young people. Yeah. Okay. But it includes everybody in their Older 90s, people. for example. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. And actually, I mean, that jogs, I mean, that fascinating finding then about, am I right in sort of saying that it was older people in Northern Ireland had a more favorable perception of their institutions? Um, yeah. And again, if you want to sort of think about that, I mean, is that some sort of an effect whereby older people had gone through the troubles or something like that? So, you know, relative to what they had come through, things were better. Or, or what, what, what was your sense of the explanation for that difference? I don't know, Fran, yes, do you want to take we, a, have a go with that one? We, we interpreted it as, as possibly um, the, the older generation who do have a... Uh, more positive attitudes as being um, as having maybe lower expectations uh, of, of these uh, of this because and, and society because of their uh, past experience and we do see a widening of attitudes uh, and and uh, attitudes increasingly negative attitudes among younger cohorts in Northern Ireland particularly in that last sort of 2013 to 2018 period, um, which chimes with recent studies in Northern Ireland, both surveys of, of younger people and uh, and also focus groups about, um, you know, people planning to leave and frustration, particularly among the younger generation that their their most pressing needs are not are not being met. OK, another fascinating question from Kieran Fox. Uh, does the satisfaction with democracy question for Northern Ireland ask about UK democracy or specifically Northern Ireland democracy within the UK. So what was the sort of the level of government um, specified in the questions? Yeah, yeah. So uh, as we mentioned, um, because this was a cross-national European survey, they asked people in Northern Ireland about the satisfaction with democracy in the UK. And when it comes to things like political institutions, they also asked about institutions in the UK as well. So the, the findings for Northern Ireland, we felt were going to be a kind of combination of how things were operating in Ireland, but also the United Kingdom as a whole. Interesting. Um, yeah, no, I, I just happened to be event earlier on today um, where one of the discussions, if you ask questions like this in some countries where there's very strong local government, uh, people can feel connected to a strong local government, but very disconnected from a strong central government, uh, depending. So I guess it's, it's a complicated issue. We don't have the time now uh, to work it out. Uh, from Dermot McLaughlin, when might a joint uh, Ireland-Northern Ireland survey be initiated? There's clearly a need for exactly this type of coordinated strategic approach. Um, so as researchers, I think the answer to the question is when should the data be collected? The answer is ASAP. Um, but I don't know, did it, during the course of the research, were there were there any discussions about the possibility of this being done? I know we have we haven't uh, we haven't uh, had those discussions with with um I suppose agencies that might collect them, but uh, I mean I think it's it's a conclusion that we reach for nearly all of the studies, uh, Alan, in in the uh, shared island um research program is that you know the need for for more um com comparable data and i think it would it would really uh it would really help across a whole range of um yeah a whole thanks. range of issues i mean as somebody else i see has mentioned here about doing some further analysis of the the census data and obviously that wouldn't get us uh uh you know that wouldn't contain attitudinal survey but i think you know there there um are at least some opportunities there with the with the new um census data in in ireland and northern ireland to look at you know some of the economic type factors um and labor yeah, market no, factors and it's know, interesting but, i think just yeah. just could come to you in a second problem but i think with, with an increasing sort of level of academic interest in in this area and more and more people mm. looking at north south issues um i think everybody is coming up against this uh this point as well uh, and i mean genuinely again the, the whole objective behind the shared island unit was to sort of learn okay and, yes. and, and exploit this idea of the two uh, jurisdictions on the island and sort of developing a sense of what works and what doesn't in terms of public sector uh, you know public service provision uh, a whole range of other things but if, if we don't have the data it's very hard to, yeah. to achieve the mutual learning sorry fran you wanted to come in there Yes, it was just to add in, Alan, I suppose that the, uh, you know, the, there is actually a Northern Ireland Social Attitudes Survey and there isn't a survey in the Republic of Ireland ongoing. So we have been reliant on European surveys and what they ask in European surveys for for years. So I suppose that was particularly highlighted in, in this study that uh, 
while there's 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 quite a good time series of attitudes in Northern Ireland, that's not the case uh, here in Ireland. And uh, it is interesting, and we would argue important uh, to document some of these attitudes. Um, more sort of tricky question: Will these records have any impact on future government policy, North and South? Um, What do you think? I think, I mean, James, you touched on this a little bit, but uh, do you want to develop the point or not? Um, I mean, I think I, I would like to believe so. Uh, I think, I, I, I suppose in many ways, and this, I suppose it feeds back into the, into the previous point, is that there needs to be a kind of sense even in a kind of time series way, in a historical sense, where which direction attitudes are going, and so if if one is able to show that attitudes are going in a certain direction, uh, then that should, in theory, uh, raise alarm bells for governments if that data is available and made to inform. I, I do think at the same time that it's not just um, governments who can learn from this kind of stuff and use this kind of uh, information. I think uh, civil society and nonprofit groups, community organizations, these kinds of uh, the kind of glue, I suppose, the social glue, the structures of society can be informed by these kinds of findings and hopefully use those to um, collaborate and also uh, uh, see where problems may be particularly arising. Uh, the kind of responsibility from the bottom up as well as the top down, maybe. Okay, uh, I see a, a comment from uh, Dermot O'Doherty uh, just pointing out that in 2014, the CSO and NISRA uh, did do a, a comprehensive uh, comparison of the 2011 census in each jurisdiction. Uh, so suggesting that uh, uh, something like that be uh, redone, and that's a, a very good idea. Uh, Gary Carvel has asked, uh, can you explain again why religious attitudes were not surveyed or examined? So are, 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 are they in the survey or were they just not? Uh, so um, yeah, no. Um, in the Euro, the Eurobarometer data, which had the most comparable questions over time, it didn't regularly capture people's religious religious re uh, affiliation. Unfortunately. Okay. I uh, going, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say no, we're no, going back to this issue that we're relying on, you know, European wide surveys. So these are quite, you know, so they're not. They're not designed with um, with Ireland and Northern Ireland in mind, you know. So they're they're uh, they're quite general surveys, and then you know we're uh, yeah. They also have relatively small samples, you know. So you can't get into as as we we were mentioning at the start to to look at some of the um, minority groups of interest, you know, where where you would expect there to be um, differences in in uh, attitudes as well, because there's just, you know, they're, they're, they're very large uh, surveys across Europe, but then within each country, there's not such a big sample. Yeah. OK, look, unfortunately, we, we've hit our four o'clock deadline. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm I'm reluctant to um, sort of put any more questions because because some of them are relatively complicated in nature so they they'd require i think a uh, more substantive response so uh, just remind everybody that the, the report is available uh online and i think you, you'd have got the sense already that the, there's a huge amount in the report uh so well worth uh taking a uh, a good look through it so um i just want to again congratulate james helen fran grange and, and stephanie who's with us uh on a fascinating report um it's uh it's an, in either jurisdiction it would have been fascinating and uh, there's just so much to think through uh, but in that comparative uh sense there's an awful lot more again helen you want the last word i was i was just going to advertise on it because it came up in some of the questions as well there is uh some future work coming out around uh attitudes to uh immigrants and, and migration um so i i think uh so watch this space uh it's certainly becoming a an increasingly important topic, I think, for us to... There you to... go. And a, a new feature of ESRI webinars, trailers, <laughs> uh, which is com coming soon, coming attractions. <laughs> okay, listen, thanks so much. We had a huge, over 200 people joined us today, so very, very grateful uh, to all the participants and as ever very grateful to our colleagues in the Shared Island Unit uh, for facilitating uh, all the work that we were discussing today. So with that, I'm going to uh, just say again, goodbye and thanks so much.